outset, I'd like to thank the organizers of the event for inviting me to talk on this important subject. So, I mean, I, while I was sitting, I was looking at the logo of the Sri Lanka Association of Child Development. It is a very nice uh, blooming lotus tower with a pot over there. So I think they have done it with a purpose. And uh, so, so that was one of my observations besides listening to cerebral palsy. Okay, so with that, we will start my talk. Uh, <clears throat> before going into uh, the the examination per se, I would my talk will be very you know the, I'll try to cover basics because I will not be able to give everything about examination, but all the basic things about examination I will try to cover, provided that videos are going to work. So approach to CP child. Now you listen to uh, you know very comprehensive talks about CP assessment. The, the how it develops and the, the assessment of the gate and all. So assessment of the CP child starts with the history. So it is the birth history, maybe the some other medical history and the surgical history if relevant. And the birth history include prenatal, perinatal and the postnatal. And if the child, the baby has been in the neonatal ICU, and then the reason for being in the ICU is a very important part of the history in the, in the assessment of the CP child. Then comes the details about the milestones. Of course, I think we have dealt with at some point. So the history is the most important thing. If uh, uh, <clears throat> one uh, fundamental uh, thing that you need to remember, if you see a child just at the, be at the beginning of the walking age, Coming with a tiptoeing, either unilateral, or unilateral, the first thing that you need to suspect is the cerebral palsy. If there's a bilateral tiptoeing, I hope you can hear me. If there's a bilateral tiptoeing, chances are less compared to unilateral tiptoeing. Still, the chances are there. So that is keep that keep that message in your mind. Second thing is about the visual, then the visual gate analysis. Of course, people talk, oh, there's a, there was a comprehensive talk on gate analysis. So I'm not going to talk much about it. To summarize that talk, there are two or three types of gate analysis available at present. One is observational gate analysis. That is what we do now. And that more or less equally effective when it comes to decision making compared to your 2D gate analysis and the 3D gate analysis and then most sophisticated gate analysis available at present is the 3D gate analysis. I think Taral will be, be, you know, <clears throat> emphasize more on that part when he was talking. So visual gate analysis is the second part of the important, second important part when you approach a CP child. And with that, you come to uh, uh, the the uh, classification system, which is commonly used by everybody all over the world, that is called gross motor function classification system. Abbreviation is GMFCS. So that gives some idea about the gate of that particular child or the, or the status at the time of start, at the time that you're going to start your treatment. So it has five scales, GMFCS one to five, for easy remembers, remember with GMFCS 1 to 3 are the ambulators and 4 and 5 are non-ambulators. Then among ambulators type GMFCS 1 is able to walk independently and able to climb stairs independently. Type 2 is able to walk but unable to climb stairs and 3 is able to walk with support. 4 and 5, those are non-ambulators. 4 is able to sit up independently and it's a wheelchair bound. And the 5 is even unable to even sit up. So they are, you know, in the bed. So that is the simple way of remembering. But the details about this GMFCS is available in any textbook. Then comes a static clinical examination. So that is the part that I am going to describe in my talk. And 
here I am basically I have been asked to concentrate mainly on the low limb examination. But remember when you examine it is all the limbs are equally important but I will concentrate mainly on low limb examination. Then the fourth one is the radiological examination if relevant depending on the age of the child. The most commonly used radiographs in, in CP children are x-ray pelvis for hips and spinal x-rays and in certain instances of course MRI scans of the brain. So those are the parts of the radiological examination. Then the gait analysis if the facilities are available, I, I think we talked about it in detail and after doing all that, the most important thing is you have to set realistic goals for treatment. The goals which are realistic in United States may not be realistic in Sri Lanka. So you have to consider the patient's background, the facilities available in your institution and how frequently they will come for the follow-up. All these are very important when you set realistic goals for treatment in a CP child. Okay, this is how, how I approach when a child with a CP comes to me. Okay, moving on to static clinical examination. We, these are the main steps in the clinical examination in the lower limbs. So, my remember, <coughs> please remember that all these examinations are, you do, you do passive movements of relevant joints all the time. So, it is, you assess the length of the muscle by looking at the range of motion of the joint. Then you look at the muscle tone to differentiate spasticities from contracture by clinically. Then you need to look at the strength of the muscles. Then selective motor control. I mean, you know the reason for the selective motor control. It is coming from the, from the brain and certain muscles act and certain muscles, do, they don't act. So that is for the selective motor control. And then all this leads to liver arm dysfunction. You hear about the liver arm and then all these effects lead to torsional, uh, torsional changes and malalignment of various joints and the limbs. So those are the parts of static clinical examination. These are the things that I am going to cover up during next few minutes. So we'll start with muscle length, the range of motion of the joint. <coughs> In the lower limb, two important groups of muscles for the to start with, starting from hip to downwards. In the hip, the important one is the hip flexors and the hip adductors. So those are the two groups which get affected in a child with a CP. And sort of before moving into that, but just uh, the, the one important thing that is mentioned in that previous talk, they are having growth, I mean, in a basic classification, either they are having hemiplegic cerebral palsy or a diplegic cerebral palsy. And all of you, do, you should know how, what is the difference between the, di, the, the diplegia and paraplegia. Okay, so that is one of the basic things that you need to know. And then hemiplegic cerebral palsy, there are various gait patterns available. I think it is mentioned comprehensively in the previous talk. And the diplegic cerebral palsy, again, gait patterns, several gait patterns are available. But for easy reference, there are two common gait patterns by diplegic cerebral palsy. One is a jump gait, another one is a crouch gait, right? So those are the two gait patterns that you see, commonly see in, in diplegic cerebral palsy. Right, coming back to uh, hips, hip flexors, this is mainly the main flex of the hip is iliopsoas, and then the, this test is to check whether there is any <coughs> spasticity or contraction of the iliopsoas muscle. This is called Thomas's test. You can do, uh, there are two ways of doing it. You can flex both hips together and then relax both uh, and there to eliminate lumbar low doses and then extend one hip to see whether there's any, resid any residual flexor, con any flexor contracture. So then this is, this is you are doing uh, Thomas's test by flexing one side of the hip. That is the, no the, the, the normal, you assume that that is the normal side and then you flex the hip to the maximum and then you see 
whether there is a, when you extend the other knee, other hip, whether there is any, whether you are developing any lumbar lordosis. You can see with those two arrows. And it is, uh, I mean, it is very easy to demonstrate on a patient than, you know, showing it in a presentation. But this is, I mean, Thomas's test is a very common test that you do to assess any contracture of the, uh, the uh, so, so as. So this is the angle that you measure. So that is the lordotic, the, the, the amount of flexion contracture that the child is having. So when there is a uh, knee flexion, fixed flexion of the knee joint, you need to have a the different way of assessing hip flexors, contractures. So there is, you can see in this child, you can see the, the uh, this is how the way that you measure whether, whether you see whether, whether the knee contracture is coming from the joint or from the muscle. Here the hip is fully extended and the ankle is in a plantar flex position and the knee is you can see knee is in a fixed flexion deformity. So that is because there is this, this particular uh, contracture is coming from the joint itself and not from the muscle. And then when you, uh, when there's a patient like that, I hope this video works. Yeah. So you get the child to the edge of the table to neutralize your, the flexion deformity of the hip, flexion deformity of the knee and then you test for the Thomas's test, right? So that is how you neutralize your, your knee contracture and then assess your hip joint. And all these physical, uh, clinical assessments were, they have done, I mean, there, were, there are enough papers available in the literature comparing the reliability of the physical examination with, with, uh, uh, the, the, the gate and gate with, with the with more sophisticated methods and then they have found that this uh, the physical examination findings are equally reliable with uh, other with the with when you compare to other sophisticated methods then comes to hip adductors so there are these are the, the you measure you uh, check hip adduction adductor contractors in hip and knee flexion as well as hip and knee extension so main adductors, the the when uh, when you hip uh, main, when you uh, examine the hip with uh, knee flexed, of course, there are th muscles which are on the the main adductor muscles are adductor longus, brevis, and magnus that you test those things, and in addition to that, there is a muscle called gracilis, which crosses both the hip joint and the knee joint. When you flex the knee joint. Of course, your gracilis is relaxed, and you are testing only the only the 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 the, the pure adductors of the hip. And when you extend the knee joint, of course, then you have the gracilis comes into play. And then, if there is any limitation of the abduction with the gracilis uh, come into play, so that means that you know that this has come from the gracilis. Okay, so that is how, I hope it is clear. So that is how you differentiate whether it is coming from the gracilis and then part of the, uh, the, 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 the medial hamstrings, whether it comes into play here or not. Then comes the hamstrings and then the, you measure the popliteal angle and then remember when you measure popliteal, how do you measure the popliteal angle? It is, the hip is 90 degrees and the knee you start from the, the resting position and then check whether the whether you are able to get it to the maximum extension. And this is how you test it. And the popliteal angle is the angle that I have marked it here, not uh, not the uh, the knee angle. And here you measure the functional length of the hamstrings. And normal range varies with the age. The older the child, functional the normal range varies. And because they have they have increased muscle bulk, and then because of that, the normal change varies. And then, then you do another test called pop, the the hamstring shift or popliteal shift test, where you be, be relax both psoas muscles, and then you measure the popliteal angle. And when you do that, you get some idea about the amount of the the contribution of the psoas muscle. In the when you uh, to the to the flexion contracts of the knee. 
So this is the popliteal shift test, and this is the, pop the amount of popliteal angle that you measure. So this will give a true idea about the true length of the hamstrings. Then moving ag again, we are still in the thigh. You measure, then you measure, the, this is the test to see any spasticity of the rectus femoris muscle, which is again an important muscle which causes uh, two joints. And this is called Duncan Ellis test. You put the child into the prone position and the and you flex the knee joint, the relevant side, you think the involved side, and see whether there is any any uh, the, the the lifting of the pelvis from the bed. Right? When there's when the pelvis lift up from the bed, that means that rectus femoris is spastic, and then so that you need to do some intervention for that. So that is called Duncan Ellis test. So this is uh, how you do it. You can see the pelvis is raising when you do that test. So again, uh, there are enough uh, evidence to show that this is this clinical test test has a very good predictive value, especially when you are performing some other surgeries based on your clinical findings. Then comes downwards, again, then about assessment of the gastrosoleus complex, and this is the famous silver scoid test. And here you do uh, the dorsiflexion of the ankle with knee inflection and knee in extension. When the knee is in knee is in flexion, you are neutralizing the gastrocnemius muscle, which is a biarticular muscle which crosses the knee joint and the ankle joint. And the soleus muscle is not biarticular. It is, it is, it arises below the knee joint and it crosses only the ankle. So when you flex the knee, you neutralize the gastrocnemius and you assess only the soleus muscle. When you extend the knee, you assess both muscles together so that by, do, by, by doing this test, you can find out which muscle is affected and which group of muscles are involved in in this ankle spasticity or contracture. So this is how you do it. This is, this is knee in extension. You can see the ankle dorsiflexion. And this is when the knee is flexed, of course, you can get better ankle dorsiflexion. That is because when you relax the gastrocnemius, of course, the, the dorsiflexion is better, so that it is coming from that muscle. Okay, so that's about, uh, the main assessment of the muscle length, the main muscle groups. So we'll move on to the second part, the assessment of the tone of the muscle. Here, it, this is very important uh, because uh, this is uh, the differentiation of spasticity from contracture is an essential part in the management of cerebral palsy, one of the essential parts. And here, therefore, you have to have a good knowledge about how to do it clinically. And here, this modified tardive scale comes into place. I think this uh, the picture is clear, and this is uh, this shows a measurement of the popliteal angle. And then you, you put the patient supine, hip 90 degree flex, and then you try to do the measure the popliteal angle. And first one is you do a rapid stretch, and then stop at one point. That is called R1, that is the first catch. And then after that, you do a slow stretch and you may be able to go improve the popliteal angle by going further. So that is called R2, so that is the second catch. If R2 is more than R1, okay, if the R2 is more than R1, that means there is no contracture, there is only spasticity. That means after the rapid stretch, passively you are able to stretch that muscle to a further extend uh, and improve the popliteal angle. So that is that group of muscles are spastic. If uh, R2 equals to R1, so that means after your rapid stretch, you are not able to move any further by doing a slow stretch. So that means there is some, there is a contracture of that group. 
okay so that is the fundamental thing about modified tardive scale which is very important in assessing a cerebral any ch a child with cerebral palsy and this you can apply to any group of muscles or any joint so this is uh, uh, R1 and R2. Okay. I hope it is clear at the ankle. This is another one. Sorry, I'll play it again. Sorry. R1, R2. Then comes the muscle strength. So, the one of the important things in cerebral palsy is to see whether the child is having adequate when it when you come to, when you when you are dealing with the lower limb problems one important thing is whether the child is having adequate trunk control so when you intervene say you decide to intervene in in maybe in surgical surgically to do certain things in cerebral palsy and if the child does if child doesn't have adequate trunk control of course you are not going to gain that much by intervening at that point so therefore you have to do this test this is called kneeling <laughs> test and then you ask the child to uh, the, the, the stand with the with the knee and see whether they can get a good balance kneeling balance at least for about 40 seconds without any any uh, any problem so that that as therapist that you need to achieve that kneeling balance when you are treating with the children with cerebral palsy then the next one is about the muscle strength. Developing muscle strength is important. And then you assess the muscle strength by, you know, assessing usual scales. And you have to uh, do all what is possible to improve the muscle strength in these children. Then comes the liver arm dysfunctions. And we talked about liver arm dysfunction, about torsional profiles and limb alignment. Again, here, few, few tests are important. Uh, you do. You need to examine hip internal rotation and external rotation, preferably in the prone position, and document it at the beginning, uh, at the at the beginning, and then one of the things, one of the main uh, problems with cerebral palsy children is they have increased antiversion of the hip, uh, in increased antiversion, femoral increased femoral antiversion, which leads to introing gait and other to the liver arm problems how to clinically assess this antiversion you put the child the child into the prone position and then do internal rotation of the hip and you come to the point where you feel the greater trochanter to the maximally on the lateral side and then you measure the angle that i have shown in that slide and that is the angle which is comparable for the femoral antiversion of that child right you put the child prone position and then start with the neutral position and then slowly do femoral antiversion while holding your hand on the lesser trochanter and the point where the lesser trochanter sorry greater trochanter the point where the greater trochanter of the humerus is most prominent laterally you measure the angle and that is the amount of femoral antiversion that child is having and this is again validated by doing various other studies including 3d ct scans and the clinical examination is as equally accurate as as uh, the other studies to assess the femoral antiversion then comes the, the, the another co important component of uh, the to liver arm dysfunction is the, the to tibial torsional profile and here you measure this is how you measure the angle it is the imaginary axis along the center of the thigh and then the imaginary axis along the center of the foot 
which goes between the second and the third toe and then you measure that angle and then you get some idea about whether this torsional thing is coming from the thigh itself that whether it's an internal tibial torsion or external tibial torsion and then there's another way of doing it using the bimalleal axis for that you need to there's the the, the, the put the the transcondyle axis horizontally by putting the patient prone and a, a knee in extended position so uh, this cp child children they may have various types of torsional malalignment this is one one uh, torsional malalignment that you can see here this child is having tibial in torsion as well as uh, sorry femoral to in torsion as well as tibial torsion and this one is having femoral out they are outtoing of the proximal femur from uh, outtoing as well as the, the tibial outtoing and then this one is femoral tibial femoral in torsion and tibial uh, the, the extrusion right so various types of rotational malalignments can happen in in cerebral palsy children and then you need to assess them clinically and then address accordingly so in conclusion it's very important to have very accurate clinical examination which is the base for ideal management strategy for the cerebral palsy children so these are very i mean what i described is very fundamental clinical examination that you need to do and that those if you do those things properly it gives an idea about about what needs to be done and again at the same time it is very important in cerebral palsy management to find out what not to do in addition to what to do in those children thank you very much दर्वा और दु देख पासुवे पहली वचन कथा नुकीरीम ओटिसम तत्वे लक्षण यक वे हकी ओटिसम लादरुवी दी महादुना गतोत होंदिन पालने कल हकी नोपमा वामतन इकाई काई हताई हार सियानुवाई बिंदु तुने S L A C D सा C D B सामु हिकम हेवरा Your child has not spoken clear words by 2 years of age. It could be a sign of autism. Autism can be successfully managed if identified at an early age. Call our helpline on 0117490000. A joint effort by the SLACD and CDB. குழந்தை இரண்டு வயதுக்கு பின்னரும் தெளிவாக பேசாவிடின் அது ஓட்டிசத்தின் அறிகுறியாக இருக்கலாம் ஓட்டிசத்தை சிறு வயதிலேயே இனம் கண்டு கொண்டால் அதனை கட்டுப்படுத்தலாம் தாமதியாது அழையுங்கள் சைபர் ஒன்று ஒன்று ஏழு நானூற்று தொன்னூறு சைபர் 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 இது எஸ் எல் ஏ சிடி மற்றும் சிடிபி இணைந்து செயற்திட்டம்